Okay, hello. Welcome to tonight's event. Um, this event is hosted by the Living Earth Collaborative, the St. Louis Zoo, and the St. Louis Academy of Sciences. I am pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Andrea Baden, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at Hunter College at the City University of New York. She is also the director of the Hunter Primate Molecular Ecology Lab and a scientific advisor for the Center Val Bio Research Station in Ranamafan National Park in Madagascar. She received her BA from the University of Miami and her MA and PhD from Stony Brook, and then she did a postdoc at Yale. She has been studying lemurs in Madagascar for almost two decades and has spent the past 15 years conducting fieldwork and laboratory analyses of the critically endangered black and white ruffed lemurs. Her research takes an interdisciplinary approach combining traditional fieldwork and molecular genetic techniques to answer larger evolutionary questions regarding primate social and reproductive strategies. Her research has been funded by large federal grants from the National Science Foundation, as well as private funding from conservation organizations and grants from private foundations like the Leakey Foundation. She has published extensively on the population genetic structure, health, and behavior of rough lemurs in some of the top scientific journals. Her work also addresses broader conservation issues across Madagascar. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Baden. All right. Well, thank you um, for the lovely introduction. Thanks for having me, and thanks to all of you for coming out to hear me speak today. Um, so as Krista said, I will be describing some of the recent research that I've been doing with the black and white rough lemurs um, in Madagascar, and hopefully will give you an idea of how we can use some of the results um, from my ongoing work to turn what many consider a crisis in Madagascar into a conservation opportunity. So broadly speaking, I consider myself a primate behaviorist with research interests in the evolution and maintenance of complex social behaviors with a particular emphasis on fission-fusion social dynamics and also cooperative infant care strategies. However, when investigating larger evolutionary questions such as these, I think it's really important to take both a collaborative and an integrative approach. So as such, my research tends to, uh, to um, use traditional methods in primate behavioral ecology, as well as methods and principles from both molecular ecology and conservation biology to address aspects of primate social systems that might not be easily detected based on observations alone. So for instance, using techniques in molecular ecology, we can infer things like patterns of dispersal and gene flow among species groups as well as populations. We can use the same information to estimate underlying patterns of genetic relationships within groups or within social communities. And then combining this information with data from behavioral ecology methods, we can then begin to understand the uh, underpinnings and outcomes of any number of diverse primate social behaviors. So things like aggression, affiliation, and cooperation. Now, a majority of my work has focused on the lemuriform primates, so these are commonly referred to as Madagascar's lemurs. This is the most taxonomically diverse radiation of strepsirines, so this, uh, this group includes five different families of lemurs and more than 103 species. This number continues to climb with new molecular genetic techniques, so we're discovering new primates all the time in Madagascar. And this is a relatively ancient clade, meaning that lemurs evolved anywhere from about 55 to 75 million years ago, and they've been um, considered the primitive behavioral state of primates by many because they resemble many non-primate mammals and many aspects of their behavior and their ecology. And so rough lemurs, or I'm sorry, lemurs more generally, uh, present us with this really unique and important opportunity for us to investigate the earliest evolution of what many of us consider to be uniquely primate traits. So to this end, um, as Krista said, I established and run and maintain a uh, research site, a long-term field site in southeastern Madagascar. This is home to the Rana Mafana Rough Gleamer project that I established back in 2005, and I've continued research there ever since. 
And then in addition, I also direct and maintain the Primate Molecular Ecology Lab that's based um, up here on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And so in collaboration with ecologists, endocrinologists, nutritionists, um, genomicists, bioinformaticians, members of my lab are using multiple lines of evidence to investigate um, the evolution, the ecology, and the behavior of Madagascar's lemurs. And so what I try to do here is just give you an idea of the smattering of different kinds of projects that we're currently working on in my lab. So they range from things like you know, down here, this behavioral ecology, so things like infant care strategies, describing fission-fusion social dynamics, trying to understand animal movement and how it relates to forest structure, but then taking it a step further and trying to understand things like um, their reproductive physiology, nutritional ecology, species distributions, but also using the genetics to inform conservation and understand their behavior, so things like population genetics, landscape genetics, et cetera. Now, that may seem like a very diverse smattering of things and maybe don't necessarily very clearly um, relate to each other, but actually all of those different lines of inquiry um, help us to address two overarching research questions. And so the first of these is how do landscape features influence patterns of distribution, migration, and genetic diversity in wild primate populations? And the second of these is how those resulting patterns of underlying genetic relatedness can help us to investigate um, the evolution and maintenance of these complex traits. Now, because this is a con I always, this is a hard thing to say, a conservation conversation, trying saying that five times fast. Um, because this is a conservation talk, I decided to focus on the first of these two questions, but anyone who's interested in the latter, um, feel free to talk to me after, after this talk or reach out to me. Okay, so as I said, I focus on the lemurs. Um, the lemurs are one of four endemic mammalian radiations that are found in Madagascar. In addition to these fun tenrex, the nizamine rodents, like the giant jumping rat, and also the eupleurids, which are things like these fusa, these mongoose-like creatures. All of these animals are endemic to Madagascar, meaning they're found there and no place else in the world. So Madagascar is a really special place. It's the fourth largest island in the world. It's located about um, 400 kilometers off the southeastern coast of mainland Africa. It's been isolated, and it's, when I say fourth largest, it's hard to get an idea of what that means. It's roughly the size of Texas, or approximately three and a half times the size of Florida, just to put this in perspective. And it's been isolated from the rest of mainland Africa for about 85 million years. So anything that lives on Madagascar has been evolving in relative isolation ever since. Now, it's a really rich biodiversity region, but sadly, it's also considered among the 36 top biodiversity hotspots. A biodiversity hotspot seems like it might be a really great thing, um, but in order to be considered a biodiversity hotspot, that means that the biodiver biodiversity has to be threatened with imminent extinction. So everything that's found in Madagascar is, is in dire straits at this point. Um, this is largely due to deforestation and habitat loss. This is the biggest driver of species extinctions on the island. And this is largely due to um, local agricultural practices. So this is called Tavi, it's slash and burn agriculture. And this practice is used because rainforest soils are really poor quality. So it's actually really difficult to grow anything on, in these rainforest soils. And so the way people are able to, to sort of work around this is that they'll cut a forest They'll burn that forest, and then the ashes that come from the burned trees are actually, they go back into the soil and are used as fertilizer. So this is great fertilizer for growing things like cassava or um, uh, the, the cultivation of, of rice on the hillsides in addition to the paddy cultivation. Sadly, though, this only works for about three different iterations, and then it has to be abandoned and they move on to new areas. Uh, so just to give you an idea, then, of what this has resulted in, this is a study on your left by Veedant and colleagues that was published in 2018. And so what you can see is up here in the top and then also in this little um, map down here at the bottom, by 1953, Madagascar had already lost about half of its forest cover. And what Veedant found from their study is that another half of that has since been lost since 1953. So this is what forest cover looked like in the 1950s, and then as you move down through each of these panels, this is western forest and eastern forest, as you move through the panels, anything that's a really warm color, so reds, oranges, yellows, that's recent deforestation. And so what you see is that in this third panel on either side, anything that's green is the only forest that remains. 
Okay, so if you go from something like this to something like this, this gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. Now this bottom panel also shows that in addition to lots and lots of fragmentation, so these big parcels of land are being fragmented into smaller and smaller island habitats, what this is showing you down here at the bottom is that all of the remaining forest is now in really close proximity to an edge. And so in addition to being fragmented, now you have edge effects. So this is lots of deleterious effects, like things are a lot warmer, there's a lot less rain, it's a lot drier, and so this is something else that the animals and plants living in these areas have to deal with. Now sadly, um, this is a recent study that we just published in January in collaboration with people from, with Adam Smith from the New York Botanical Garden, where we, we modeled what, might, what this might look like into the future. And what we ended up finding is that if deforestation rates stay the same as they did in 2014, we estimate that before 2080, all of uh, Madagascar's eastern rainforests will be completely gone. So this is really alarming for any of us who are working in Madagascar, any of us who are interested in lemurs and conservation. Um, and so maybe one bright side to this is that if you look at a strict forest protection scenario where protected areas actually protect forests, meaning that you're able to keep those areas intact, then by 2077, anything that's outside of protected areas is gone, but at least what's inside the protected areas remains. However, we do also know from personal experience, from lots of studies, that you do see encroachment into these protected areas as you know, human needs arise. And so if we have this relaxed forest protection scenario, then what you can see is that it's just being whittled down and down and down until you get into the 2070s and it basically disappears. So, what members of my lab are really interested in then is in light of this information, in light of these anthropogenic pressures, so what we are doing ourselves to the environment, one primary aim in the lab is to investigate how these and other anthropogenic pressures are impacting the patterns of migration and gene flow in lemurs. Okay, so why might fragmentation matter, right? Why does gene flow even matter? Well, if we think back to our biology classes in high school, I'll do a quick primer so we're all on the same page, but if we think back to our biology classes, we know gene flow is really important for maintaining genetic diversity within a population and also for maintaining genetic continuity between populations. Now, the reason this matters is that genetic diversity is the currency of evolution. Right? So we need there to be diversity in order for animals to adapt to things like climate change, to things like disease. Right? We also know that when gene flow is interrupted by something natural, say, so like a river or a mountain range, this can lead to the gradual accumulation of changes in each of these different populations, and this can result in a classic example of something like allopatric speciation. Okay? So this is something that happens all the time. This is happening for millennia, that you've got gene flow being disrupted, and then animals speciate. Right? and they adapt and they speciate. And this is occurring generally, usually, over a relatively gradual time period so that it allows these animals to acclimate to the changes that they're facing. The problem is that this isn't the only thing that's happening, right? So you've got these natural barriers to gene flow, but you've also got anthropogenic ones. And these tend to happen much faster and on much larger scales. So what we end up seeing in these cases is that you can often see um, genetic population uh, bottlenecks. And so basically what this means is that you start with a large, relatively genetically diverse population, and that when some sort of fragmentation happens, you can then see this rapid reduction in population size and a rapid redu reduction in genetic diversity, and that can then lead to these um, these major changes in terms of inbreeding depression or drift that can then drive these species to extinction. And this oftentimes then also, depending on the animal's side, size, on its locomotor patterns. Ooh, well, that was very, what is happening? What is going on? Anybody? Where's Avi? <laughs> um, I don't know what is happening here. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> Here we go. So, depending on its size, on its locomotor patterns, and on its dietary strategies, this can then lead to these small, isolated populations that occur across a fragmented landscape. And so the question that we're asking in the lab then is what does this fragmentation mean for things like the black and white rough lemur? Okay, now I'm going to present to you only the results from the black and white rough lemur study today, but I do just want to point out 
that we have lots of other taxa that we're also working with. So um, in Madagascar, for instance, we're working with several brown lemurs in the northwest. We're working with the, the flagship species, right, the ring-tailed lemurs in the southwest, but also animals like the purple-faced langurs in Sri Lanka and also vervet monkeys from South Africa. So these same sorts of questions, these same sort of methods apply regardless of where it is in the world that you're looking. But so why the black and white rough lemurs? Why would we care about rough lemurs of, of all of them? Well, just to give you an idea, and many of you probably already know what the rough lemurs are. They're at zoos all over the place. You have these rough lemurs here um, at the St. Louis Zoo. But these are moderately sized lemurs. They're about three to four kilos, so they're roughly the size of a large house cat. They're arboreal uh, quadrupeds, meaning that these animals run around on all fours up in the trees. And they're obligate frugivores. So their, their, their diet is up to 94% uh, fruit, and they tend to rely on these really large, crowned, emergent, slow-growing trees. Okay? Um, they're also really highly social. So they're these really cool animals. They live in groups that defend, communally defend a territory. So there's about 30 animals in a large social group that defends a territory. But then within that territory, these animals have variable social relationships. So they have preferences for friends, for relatives, things like this. Um, which makes them really fun to study. And they also defend really large home ranges. And this is something that'll come back in um, toward the end of the talk. So just try and file this away in your memory for later. Now, what makes them really good systems for studying these questions about fragmentation and what that means for their conservation is that they're really widespread. So they're found all throughout the eastern forests of Madagascar. They are patchily distributed, which makes it really difficult for us to figure out where they actually occur and also to figure out true population sizes. But what's important about them is that they're really, um, they're highly sensitive to habitat disturbance. So they're sort of like your proverbial canary in a coal mine, right? As soon as any kind of disturbance starts to occur, as habitats become degraded, as those big hardwood trees are selectively logged, rough lemurs are the first ones to disappear. And so these animals act as really excellent indicators of ecosystem health. If you go into a forest where a rough lemur should be and they're not there, then you've got to start worrying. Um, but it's also this habitat sensitivity that's, that's led to them being critically endangered. So these guys are at risk of imminent extinction. So if we go back to this overarching question then, how does habitat fragmentation affect these animals? We have a series of different phases that we have to, to go through in order to address these questions. So the first of these is to simply go out there and describe the diversity that exists, right? So we've got to go out there and characterize the genetic diversity and the population genetic structure of these animals in the wild. With that information, we need to try and figure out, well, why do things look the way they do, right? So how can we explain the patterns that we're seeing? And with that, use it to guide conservation management moving forward. So the first thing we'll do is talk about how we characterize um, the diversity in these species. And so what we ended up doing, um, this was a study that we did back in 2014, where we sampled from throughout the entire black and white uh, rough lemur geographic range, so their entire distribution throughout Madagascar. And so what you can see here, this hashed line, is the known distribution of the species. And then all of these little dots are sampling localities. So we visited 19 different sampling localities, and across those sampling localities, we collected samples from 209 individuals. And I should note here, so they're color-coded to correspond to subspecies status. So at present, there are three different subspecies of, Varicia vari of, of black and white rough lemurs that are recognized. So you've got Subsincta in the northernmost populations, Variegata in the center, and Editorum in the south. And I mentioned this now, we'll come back to it in just a minute. Okay, so this is all well and good, but I feel like saying something like this, like, oh, we visited 19 sites, we captured 209 animals. Like, what does that actually mean, right? Because when it's all sort of um, narrowed down to something like this, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. Like, oh, yeah, sure, you captured a bunch of animals. So what does this actually look like? And so I just want to give you an idea of what field work in Madagascar consists of. So if you're really lucky, your site will exist along one of the national route, routes. Um, these are the only paved roads in Madagascar. There are not very, very many of them, and they are not very well maintained. So, you know, back in 2008, it was sort of the height of things. It was really easy to get from one place to the other, but now they're riddled with potholes, which often slows things down. So something that used to take six hours to get to now takes something like 14 hours to get to. In addition to traveling on paved roads, which is a luxury, 
this is often what field work looks like in Madagascar. So not only are you driving through mud and giant puddles that will swallow your car, more often than not, you're actually not in the car, you're behind it pushing. So, so you're pushing your car through giant puddles, and sometimes you're raft rafting your car across rivers on giant pieces of bamboo. And then, once you get to where the road ends, right, where the sidewalk ends, it's where the road ends, then you have to find alternative routes of, of transportation. And so this is us portering our, our data collection gear out to the site. This is in a dugout canoe. And when we go out to sites, we'll hire as many as 40 local porters to carry all of our stuff out there. Um, this thing here is actually a liquid nitrogen tank. So you fill it with liquid nitrogen, it cools it way down, and then it acts as your freezer in the forest for the next three weeks or so. And then once you get across the river, you walk. And you walk, and you walk, and you walk, and you walk, until you get all the way over there. So, you know, you're walking 25K, it takes like six hours to get where you want to go, but it's all worth it, right? Because then you end up someplace like this. So you pitch your tents, you set up your, your field camp, Camp, your field lab, which is literally this. We found some really cool things where you can actually run a centrifuge off of a screwdriver or a, a drill, like a battery operated drill, which is awesome. But yeah, so you get out into the forest, you set up camp, and then you've got to capture the animals. So um, this is all of the work that I've done, and this, this whole project has been done in collaboration with the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha. So this is with Ed Lewis, who's pictured here. And then also um, with Randy Youngie, who was formerly of the St. Louis Zoo, but he's now in Columbus. And so he and his uh, members of his Prosimian Biomedical Survey project have all worked together to sample these different animals. And so the way we sample the animals is we actually have to use um, remote anesthetization techniques. So this is Velu, who's our, our amazing darter that we've been working with since 2005. It looks kind of scary, um, but it's a CO2-powered rifle, and basically what this rifle does is it fires lightweight darts that are loaded with um, a, a drug that will put the animals to sleep for about an hour. So we'll shoot the animals, we'll catch them as they fall from the trees, we bring them back to camp, and we process them in our forest lab. Um, so this is also a Fidi Razambainarivu, so he was also here at the St. Louis Zoo for quite a long time. Um, but so we work together and we collect as much data as we possibly can on these animals. I figure if we're only capturing them one time or every once in a while and it's pretty risky to do this, we're gonna get all the data that we can. So we photograph them, um, we take dental molds so that you can get ages of these animals through time. We collect endoparasites, ectoparasites, blood samples, tissue samples. I've had grad students come out and actually stain their tongues and photograph the tongues to study the, like, the taste buds on their tongues. So anything you could possibly think of, um, we try and collect those data, allow them to recover, and we release them back into the forest. Some of these animals you can see, like this guy here, has got a little tag, and those are the animals that we then um, release and study in the long term to try and relate their behavior back to their genetics. So that's generally just to give you an idea of how we get these data. And then what we do is we spend a really long time waiting for CITES permission to bring the samples back to the United States. Um, and then we extract the DNA from the blood or tissue samples that we've collected. And for this particular project, we amplified the DNA at, at 10 microsatellite markers. These are neutral markers that aren't affected by natural selection. And then also the D-loop region of the mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited. And we can get lots of information about population genetic structure and diversity um, throughout the known species range just with these few um, bits of DNA that we're able to extract. And so the first thing we did was we wanted to just get an idea of at every single one of these sites where we went in and we captured ample animals and sampled them, how are they doing? What is their genetic health? What does this mean for um, the future of those particular sampling localities? Like, are they in trouble? Are they healthy? Or do they need some sort of intervention? And then what we did is we actually let the data just completely speak for themselves, didn't assign any kind of geographic location to those data, threw them all into an analysis and said, okay, you tell me how would you group these different animals together based on their genetics? And so quickly, I'll just describe to you what each of these sites looks like. So what we end up seeing is there's varying degrees of genetic diversity, varying degrees of isolation, meaning that there's something going on between those different sampling localities that does not allow migration and gene flow, which means they're isolated and could be at risk of local extinctions. We see really variable allelic diversity, um, really variable genetic distance. So what is genetic distance? Basically what this is, it's a measure that goes from zero to one. The closer you are to zero, 
The more gene flow there is, the more similar different populations are. The closer to one you are, the more isolated those populations are, the less gene flow there is. And so what you can see is that some of these populations or some of these pairs had very low genetic distance, meaning they're basically the same. It's one in the same genetic population. But some of them, this doesn't look high, but it's actually the highest of any living lemur species that's been identified to date. So that's pretty concerning. There's, there are some completely isolated populations. We see lots of evidence of bottleneck events. So remember going from large populations to really small populations really quickly with really low genetic diversity and lots of isolation by distance, which actually isn't surprising. So all isolation by distance means is the farther apart you are, the, the more different you are, right? Which isn't super surprising because if you're way the heck up here, it's unlikely that you're gonna be very closely related to the individuals way down there. Okay, so that's sort of your null model. That's just um, the expectation. So what you also see, so remember, and this is why I was saying, you know, keep this in mind, we have these three different subspecies. And so when we take all of these data, throw them into a model and say, okay, you tell me what's happening, you might expect that the different subspecies would cluster together, right? You would expect them to be more similar to each other than to anybody else. And we actually found something that was a little bit more surprising. So what we instead found is that you had a northern genetic cluster and a southern genetic cluster. Okay, and so what this, it's kind of hard to see, but these bars here, each bar represents an individual, and each of these uh, vertical bars represents a sampling locality. And so when you look at different colors, like this individual here, shares alleles with this population, but also with this population, but otherwise, they're more or less pretty distinguishable from each other. And so then the question is, okay, well, what the heck's going on then? What's, what's driving these differences? And so what we ended up seeing is that in this northern cluster, you have really high genetic diversity. So high genetic diversity, high haplotype diversity. There's 14 different mi uh, mitochondrial haplotypes. This is really good. Low pairwise FST, meaning there's lots of gene flow going on between these different populations. Only 30% of them are significantly different from each other, so this is great. Um, and there's no evidence of bottleneck events. So this suggests sufficient gene flow happening north of this Manguru River. When we get to the southern cluster, it's a very different story, and this is where we get a little bit concerned. So there's very little genetic diversity happening south of the Manguru River where these red dots are occurring. So there's significantly lower um, allelic diversity, lower haplotype diversity. Remember I said there's 14 haplotypes up here. There's three in the south. A majority of the sampling localities have one of them. I think there are only two sampling localities that shared the other haplotype. So basically everybody's the same in the south. Um, really high pairwise FST, so high genetic distances, almost 90% of these pairwise comparisons are totally different from each other. So the sites in the south are completely isolated, there's no gene flow, there's really uh, low genetic diversity, lots of population bottlenecks, so they're in trouble. Okay. So just from that alone, just by simply going out there and characterizing what the genetic health looks like in these populations, it makes some suggestions that we might want to follow up with. So the first of these is that at present, these different species or these subspecies are being managed as such. So what you end up seeing is that those three different subspecies are being treated as management units and they're bred in that way. So they're only breeding subsincta with subsincta, only breeding variegata with variegata. And what we're suggesting is that they're actually only these two genetic clusters. Maybe we should be treating them in that way. So we should be treating them as conservation management units as opposed to subspecies designations. And I just point out here that this um, the subspecies designations are based almost entirely on pelage variation, so these patterns of black and white on their backs. And this was primarily done using museum specimens. So if you go into the museums, you can pull all of these things out and sort them into different subspecies and their, their geographic regions. But what we found now is by photographing lots of these animals within a single site, you'll see this entire range of phenotype at one sampling locality. So really subspecies de designation, at least for these animals, is pretty much meaningless and we should be treating them as such. Um, we can also maybe come up with some co uh, targeted conservation. So the ones that are genetically isolated, maybe think about translocations, maybe think about making corridors. But this also raised way more questions than answers, right? So we see these differences. What the heck's going on? Why, where did these differences come from? Right? So why do we see the different patterns in northern and southern sampling localities? What drives the patterns? And when did those changes occur? And so that leads us to this second 
question that we had was the, was the drivers of gene flow. And this is something I've been working on um, with my PhD student, Amanda Mancini. Um, so she's been really heavily involved in this aspect of the research. And the way we've been able to address this question is using something called landscape genetics. And so landscape genetics is this emerging field that combines the population genetics that I just described to you, but then it pairs it with landscape ecology and spatial statistics, and that allows us to infer the dispersal ability of species by looking at different, as uh, different aspects of the landscape, different features we might think is driving genetic diversity, and relating that back to the underlying genetic diversity. So to put this into perspective then, if we take those same patterns that I just described to you, what you can do is try and relate that genetic diversity to things like the ecology, like those geographic barriers that I talked about, like their demography, so were there population size changes, and anthropogenic influence. And so what you can actually do is measure the relative effects of each of these different landscape features on the underlying genetic diversity to try and infer where dispersal corridors might actually be occurring, and then target your conservation accordingly. So just to give you an idea then of how this works, what you can do is you know a species biology, right? So you've got field biologists who are out there working with a species all of the time, and so based on your observations in the field, what you can do is say, okay, well, so I know rough gleamers, and I know that they rely on these primary forest habitats. And so I would say, okay, a forest then, as one of my landscape features, is really easy for them to move through, right? Because that's what they rely on all the time. And so I would say the resistance to moving through a forested landscape is really low, right? It's easy for them to do it. By contrast, you see throughout Madagascar that rivers are really strong barriers to gene flow. And so in this case, this is all relatively speaking, then you might say, okay, well, rivers are gonna be really high um, resistance values. They're gonna pose much harsher um, uh, challenges to movement than something like a forest. And then you can even have things like, for instance, elevation, right, altitude. So you see that animals can easily traverse low altitude, they can easily traverse mid altitude, but once they get to high altitude, it's not possible. And so you can assign variable resistance values to those features. And then you can take all of this together, put them into statistical models, and try and understand which of these is the best predictor of the genetic diversity that you're seeing. <clears throat> and so if we go back then to the results from our first study, we saw that we had these two genetic clusters and that they, they were separated by the Manguru River. So the Manguru River is the largest river on the eastern coast of Madagascar. And so to us, this seemed like an obvious choice, right? It's got to be the Manguru that's really driving a lot of the gene flow in these guys. And so in terms of the natural features that we thought might be driving this, one of them was rivers. But again, we also thought, okay, well, geographical distance is probably pay, playing a role. And this is your null model anyway, so we had to include that. But what else might be driving genetic diversity in these species? That's a natural barrier to gene flow. Well, maybe it's elevation. So we know that these animals typically are found at low to mid elevation sites, and you never find them above an altitude of about 1,200 meters. So we thought maybe that was one thing that was inhibiting gene flow. And then also topography. So what's kind of interesting about these animals is that they rely on this um, genus of plant, it's called canarium. So it's locally known as rami. And rami persist on ridges. And so we thought, okay, well maybe then the, the topography, like ridges may, may provide these dispersal corridors for these animals. But this isn't the only story, of course. Um, we also had anthropogenic features that we figured were probably playing a role in this. So we also included roads. We imagine roads probably are just as hard to cross as um, rivers could be, especially because the risk is so high. You try and cross, you get hit by a car big problem, right? Um, but also habitat quality, so things like degradation, um, agricultural land might be really tough for these animals to cross, distance to villages as a proxy for just human habitation, human population density. Um, and so usually what you do is when you're assigning landscape or when you're assigning resistance values, it is just based on sort of like, they call it's like, oh, expert opinion. So it would be like someone coming in and just asking me, hey, Andrea, what do you think? Which one's harder to cross? What value would you assign it? And I would just go and kind of wing it and say, well, based on what I've seen, I'd give that one a five, that one a 12, that one a seven. And I, right, like you make this face, it's true. You're like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> like, that's really how this works? No way, it's gotta be harder than that. Well, luckily, so that was very subjective. There's now a much more objective way of doing this, a, w a much better way um, of assigning resistances, and this is through a program called Resistance GA. So this guy, Bill Peterman, designed this program specifically to address this question, 
And what's really cool about this is that it actually uses genetic algorithms to look at each of these different landscape features and figure out through evolution of the easiest um, paths or the paths of least resistance from one point to the next, it lets them through 10,000 iterations evolve until they converge upon a best path from one site to the next. And that allows you to figure out um, which of these different landscape features are, are really important for dispersal and gene flow. So they're evolving with consecutive iterations. And then you use all these statistical models and you're able to look at these, this is the one I want you to pay attention to, AIC scores, we'll come to this in just a second. But basically you just look for the lowest AIC score, the one that's the smallest is the best model, anything that's within two of that lowest model is, is just as good. And so that allows you to then build these um, combined or composite models that then allow you to see, okay, if we combine all of these best predictors together, do you get the best answer? And so just to show you then what, what we found by doing this, the first thing is, again, isolation by distance is a thing. So um, what you can see here, this is Euclidean distance. So FST, that population differentiation, gets much higher the farther apart you get, not surprising. But this only explains about 28% of the variance that we're seeing. So that leaves a whole lot of variation that we're not able to explain by distance alone. So that means there's got to be other stuff in the landscape that's driving these patterns. And so here we go, here's the AIC scores. So these are ranked according to AIC, and what you see is that this is the best predictor. So distance to village is the best predictor of gene flow in these species. And that habitat type, and that means pristine habitat versus degraded habitat versus agricultural land are also equally good predictors of genetic diversity in these species. What you can also see, so over here, this is essentially it's a, a percent. So 55% of the time habitat type was the best model, 44% of the time distance to village was the best model, and combined they explain about 86% of the variance. So that's a really good in this, in this particular model. The next thing we do is we combine those and say, okay, now combining human uh, distance to, to human settlements and habitat quality, does that outperform each of those different landscape features in isolation, right? So does the combination of those outperform them? And in fact, yes, absolutely, it explains about 70% of the variance. So really from this we can say at the metapopulation level of black and white rough gleamers, the largest drivers of gene flow, of genetic health, of genetic diversity is us, right? So it's proximity to humans and our effects on the environment. Okay, and what you can also do, which is kind of neat, is you can take all of that information, you plug it into a program called CircuitScape, and it uses electronic circuit uh, theory to actually model or, or sort of visualize um, what, what an electrical circuit would look like. So anything that's warmer in color means there's a lot more movement, there's a lot more connectivity between those different sampling localities. And so this allows us to see then, like north of the Mangro River, there are actually these nice corridors of gene flow happening, but once you get down here, it's nice and blue and there's very little movement actually going on. Okay, so that's at a huge scale. So we're also questioning, well, does it matter if you do it at a much smaller scale? And so this is what my, my grad student Amanda is doing, is that now we've zoomed in on this teeny tiny um, fragment or proportion of the sampling and she's now replicated the study, but at a really small scale. So that's gonna give us much better resolution then, and this will be really important for reforestation efforts, trying to figure out, or just targeted conservation more broadly, like what can we do on a local scale to help improve the genetic diversity of the species? And then a second uh, student of mine, Aparna Chandrasekhar, has actually also been working with the genetic data, and what's really cool is you can use coalescent theory to actually look at those population um, size changes. So remember we said there are these genetic bottlenecks where they go from big genetically diverse populations to much smaller ones. She's modeling when that actually occurred, and then we're hoping we can relate that back to changes in the climate, changes in the habitat, changes in human activity to see um, whether we can pinpoint what's actually driving those declines in population size. Okay, so quick recap, so we're all on the same page. What do we know? We know that continued rapid fragmentation and loss is occurring all throughout the eastern rainforest habitat. We know there's variable genetic diversity across rough lemurs remaining range. We also know that habitat quality and human habitation predict gene flow, such that remote pristine forest promotes the most gene flow, and that degraded forest that's close to villages is the strongest impediment to movement between these different populations. And so what do we do about it? 
right? Because that's kind of the goal. It's all nice and good to do all of these studies and try and understand what's happening, but I think our role these days is you can't just study it, you have to actually put what you learn into action. And so if we return to that study um, where we talked about the deforestation, forests are disappearing, um, what we were also really interested in doing was not just looking at forest loss, but the sort of the bigger goal of that was to try and see if we could model um, appropriate or like good quality habitat for rough lemurs into the future, right? And so we needed that forest loss model to look at it, but we also know that forest loss isn't happening in a bubble. So there's also climate change that's happening too. And so we had, and it's, it's teeny tiny, it's hard to see, so I'm actually gonna focus in on some of these different regions. But so what you can see here, so this is the northernmost region of the rough lemurs range. And what you can see here is forest cover in isolation, so looking at 2014 cover and then 2070 cover under strict forest protection and under relaxed forest protection. And then we also have current climate and then how that changes um, according to each of these different variables. But what you can start seeing is that as, as you move down through the different panels, that the combination of forest loss and climate change is really wiping out any kind of suitable habitat that may exist. So suitable habitat would be in red, and as you can see down here, there's very little red that exists, okay? Same story happens in the center, but what I think is really important to point out is that even down here, where you've got forest loss happening, you've got climate change happening, there is still suitable habitat. I think that's really important for us to keep in mind that maybe we can use some of these results from our studies to really make a concerted effort to target our conservation on areas where these animals may be able to persist into the future, not just where they are now, but where they're going to be. Um, and then similarly in the Eastern Rainforest Corridor where I work, wah, wah, um, not much left. So, you know, so what do we do, right? What do we do about all of this? And I have this picture here to remind me that not only are these animals really important indicators of ecosystem health, they're also really charismatic and they have that really big range, right? And so these guys can be treated as umbrella species. Get it? <laughs> so they can be treated as umbrella species. It's a lot easier to convince people to care about, and I could be wrong, so please let me know, but to care about something cute and fluffy than something like maybe a Madagascar hissing cockroach. And so if we use an animal that's really sensitive to habitat change, that has this really wide geographic distribution, then not only are we protecting the rough gamers, we're protecting everybody else that they overlap with. Okay, and so this is one, hopefully one really effective way of, of conserving them into the future. So how do we take then these, these conservation crises that we're identifying and turn them into these opportunities? What do we do with this information? So um, we now have a relatively new president in Madagascar. He had sort of a, a shaky start a few years ago with a coup and then the illegal selling of hardwood trees of the rosewoods. Um, but he's now made this, this big concerted effort to re-green Madagascar. So for anyone who doesn't know, Madagascar is known as the Red Island, and that's because all of the erosion and all of the clay is, is seeping out into the oceans. But so his goal is to turn it from the Red Island into the Green Island. And so in celebration of Madagascar's 60th anniversary of their, um, of their independence, he's proposed planting 60 million trees this year across 40,000 hectares throughout Madagascar. Already in January, he um, had this pretty large effort in the Yonkazu Bay district, so they planted out one million trees over 500 hectares, so that's about one and a half times um, the size of Central Park. So this is already happening, and they've already got an additional 100 million seeds that have been cultivated, and they've offered to give these to anybody who's interested. So, you know, here, we'll give you all of these seeds, replant them, and he estimates that if every single person in Madagascar planted five trees, they would achieve their goal. So this seems great, right? And at least the enthusiasm's there, so this is really good. Um, unfortunately, lots of scientists um, criticize this because there isn't really a coherent plan, right? It's just going out and saying like, let's go reforest a bunch of habitat. But if you don't know what the animals are relying on, you don't know where to plant these trees, this is a problem, right? And also what you see is that they're not simply using endemic trees that the animals are relying on, they're using invasive species. So things like pine, things like eucalyptus, anything agroforestry that can be used um, for, 
either fuel or building homes, things like this. Um, and so what I think is a much better strategy and hopefully one that our results can inform is using scientifically based conservation. And this is something that Ed Lewis is doing, I think, pretty successfully. And I'm really proud to be affiliated with him. So this is a study that we did back in 2013 in the Kianzavatu region. And what we found is that these are different forest fragments where rough lemurs live. And we found that genetically they're completely isolated. There is no connectivity whatsoever. And so what Ed and the members of the Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership have actually started doing is employing local people to follow the animals, collect the seeds that they've defecated out because it's scientifically been shown that defecated seeds actually germinate faster and have a higher success rate once they've been deposited. So they're actually going out, collecting seeds from the feces, starting seedling nurseries, and then getting the entire community involved in reforesting the areas that we've identified as potential corridors. And what's really cool is that in concert with um, the Arbor Day Foundation, Ed and his team have already planted almost three million trees in the Kianzavatu region alone. So I think this is the kind of thing that we really need to be focusing on, is this on the ground, scientifically motivated, um, hands-on conservation action. Um, some other things that hopefully our results can help to inform is that from our circuit maps, we do highlight important corridors for gene flow. So these areas where gene flow is currently happening, we're suggesting we really need to, to really um, encourage protection of these areas. So we have to keep those particular corridors intact. We have also identified areas for um, reforestation efforts, so areas where there are completely isolated populations. Let's try and reconnect those particular habitats. I think we've also identified some important climate change refugia, potentially, so areas that even in the face of deforestation and climate change, there's still these little bits of red on the map. Let's think about really enforcing protection of those sites. And you also see some areas on the map that are outside of protected areas that are still being shown as climate refugia, so maybe we should think about protecting those too. Um, so yeah, also prioritizing new areas for conservation. And eventually, you know, if it comes down to it, there's also been talk of doing things like translocations, like reintroductions, to try and keep these different populations genetically healthy. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think that it can be really hard to come away from this feeling optimistic. There are times myself where I, you know, you get pretty down and you feel like, my God, like, what are we going to do? Is there anything we can do about this? But I do have to say that when you're working with the local communities, you're working with people on the ground, um, people are very passionate about conservation in Madagascar and people are really invested. And I do think that's a, a great thing that's really promising. And so hopefully through the concerted effort of policymakers, of local communities, of conservationists, both here and in Madagascar, um, I really do think that we can turn a crisis into a conservation opportunity. Okay, and with that, I'm hoping uh, to take any questions. I think, it's, I think it's partly utility. Um, a lot of deforestation is also happening for charcoal production. People still are using charcoal to cook most of their meals, so I think that's part of it. Um, and I think, too, it's just misguided. I don't think that there's necessarily any, um, at this point, any interest in trying to do it the right way. It's almost more of like a, a PR thing, unfortunately. Um, but so I do hope he seems open so I'm hopeful that maybe if we get, you know, plant some bugs in his ear, that maybe he'll come around. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's something called an adaptive radiation. 
And so what's really cool, and this has happened um, in lots of different islands, as you suggest, but so with Madagascar in particular, what actually happened is that Madagascar isolated from the rest of mainland Africa before primates had even evolved, before lemurs even existed. And so they evolved, we think, our best guess is that they evolved on mainland Africa, and they, along with each of those other mammalian taxa that I showed you guys, they independently rafted. I know it sounds crazy, but it happens all the time. They rafted over to Madagascar, and the cool thing is that because there was nothing there to compete with them, they diversified and radiated like crazy and filled every single open available niche that was there. And so you get what we think happened is that it was something that was pretty small, probably nocturnal, may have hibernated, because this is what we see with things like mouse lemurs. So that's what they do today are these little teeny guys that do hibernate. And so it would be really easy actually for them to raft over to Madagascar, get there, and then just proliferate. So that's, yeah, that's probably what happened. Sure, I mean, it all plays into the equation, and there's also more to genetic diversity and more to genetic health, I should say, than genetic diversity. And so Emily Rabluski is gonna be working on this moving forward with the uh, Living Earth Collaborative, though, so not looking only just at the genetic diversity, but also looking at um, MHC, so this major histocompatibility um, complex, which is basically a marker of your actual physiological health as well. Um, and then population size, of course, makes a really big difference. I mean, if you have a really small um, population size versus a really big one, I mean, natural, or I should say, uh, it's a lot harder for natural selection to act on these smaller populations. So all of this plays a role. And I think, you know, it's tough with the rapid surveys that we did because we, we weren't spending significant time at any one of those sites. And usually, I mean, we were also using microsats, and these days it's much preferred to use um, more markers than what we were able to get for this study. But I think if you definitely get more individuals and get more um, markers that you can look at, you can get a better idea of what's going on. So I think that's, that's something that's under consideration. I think that um, that's a pretty hotly contested strategy. It can be kind of controversial, but I do think too that, you know, if it's your last ditch effort to save something, then maybe it's, it's warranted, but I do think there's a lot of planning that goes into it. So you really have to get a good sense of, um, you know, introducing new diseases. So what is the actual health of those individuals? Um, are you going to be interfering with social dynamics, things like this? Um, but it's, it's an option that's on the table. So what, we, what you would do is ideally identify a population that's already at risk of being extirpated. So this happens actually, unfortunately, a lot more than you'd like to realize in Madagascar. So there are these um, mining operations that will just go into a forest and, and clear cut it. And so you know the animals are going to die anyway. And so what do you do? Well, you can take those animals and move them someplace else. And so if you can find a population that's already genetically not very diverse, maybe you can introduce these animals that are otherwise going to die, bring them into that population, assuming they're healthy and there's, there's no other identifiable risks to the population you're introducing them to. Does that answer your question? Okay. There are, yes. They're, uh, they're my biggest foes. So the fusa that I showed you a little while ago, so they're, they're the largest carnivores in Madagascar. They're, they're like a small to medium sized dog, so they're about this big. Um, they're sort of like mongoose. They're really agile in the trees, so they can actually climb trees both head first going up, but also head first coming down. Um, and they just, I lose anywhere from three to five animals from 30 in my study population every single year, which is a lot actually um, for these FUSA. So the FUSA will take rough lemurs. Um, and then not so much, there's also raptors and snakes that will eat them, but those are usually the smaller animals that they're taking, not Varicia. Like an apex, or 
Not necessarily. Yeah, because the, the FUSA, they're equal opportunity offenders. They'll eat anything. <laughs> like, and there have been lots of studies, too. Actually, Sarah Carpenty did a really cool study with the raptors where she actually um, used tree climbing technology and got up into the nests and actually looked at what animals the raptors were taking. Um, and it's just kind of opportunistic. It's like whatever they can find that they, that's small enough for them to carry around with them up to the nest. Yeah. Anyone else? Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so from the initial study, what the only obvious thing was the river. And then when we did the landscape genetic study, what's interesting is that we were actually really surprised that the river didn't come out as being a significant predictor. And, and we attributed that just to the fact that anthropogenic influences were so strong that they were basically swamping out any kind of historical signatures of, of gene flow from the, from the natural barriers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think what we can do is just be conscientious consumers. Um, so I think, you know, as, as tourists, you know, for instance, if you go to Madagascar, you spend a fortune to get there, it's your lifelong dream, you really want to see animals, and so the, the tour guides are no dummies, they learn this, right? And so they figure out, like, okay, if I show you the lemurs, I'm going to get a better tip. Like, this is going to improve the quality of your experience. And so I think it's important to us to... Um, explain why, you know, we don't want to do a, a lemur selfie or why, you know, it's not valuable to, to like shake a tree or throw branches at the animals to get them to move. Like we want to see them in their natural environments. We want to see them undisturbed. And I think communicating that kind of information is really important. In terms of enforcement of protected areas, it's so challenging because um, a lot of that comes down to resources. So for instance, the park where I work, it's 43,000 hectares, um, which is really big. And at present, well, last I knew, there were three rangers to protect that entire forest. That's it. And I think that's actually declined to like one. And so what ends up happening is they do all of this by foot um, because there aren't roads. And so they'll go out and of course, word of mouth spreads. And so everyone's like, all right, you know, <laughs> Rangers are coming, get out of the forest, and so everyone flees. And then by the time they make it you know, back to the north, people are back in the south exploiting the forest again. So I think also it's just giving people alternative um, resources. But yeah, I do think for us really it is just being conscientious consumers, and I think we can't do everything. You know, you can't do every single last thing responsibly or you'd probably never leave the house. Um, so what I always tell my students too is just, you know, think about what little changes in your life you're willing to make and what you feel comfortable doing within your own, um, you know, comfort limits and do it. Because I think every little bit helps and I think voting matters and I think putting your money where your mouth is matters. So that's my best suggestion. Yeah, so, so there's been actually a lot, that's a great question, there's been a lot of recent work that's been done on this. So um, the first I'll address is the bushmeat question. So bushmeat is a problem. It's maybe not as big of a problem as it is elsewhere in the world. And there's been some stuff that's been done recently by Courtney Borgerson and also Chris Golden that's looked a lot at this. And um, what's really interesting, and I think really sad, um, but it also gives us, you know, directions for how to improve things, is that hunting in most tribes in Madagascar is fadi, so it's taboo to actually kill and eat lemurs. People don't want to do it. People are ashamed to do it. Um, but in these studies, what, what Courtney's actually found is that the people who, are, who end up being the hunters, the ones who are willing to actually do it, are the ones whose children show visible signs of malnutrition. And so it's not to make a quick buck, it's to feed their families. 
And so I think that's something we really have to pay attention to. We have to improve the livelihoods of the people if we expect conservation to work. Um, and so there's been lots of really cool projects. So what Courtney has actually done in response to some of this is she's, they're now cultivating, um, I don't know the scientific name, but they call them bacon bugs. So there are these little bugs that actually live on the cassava plants and they apparently taste like bacos, <laughs> like bacon. Um, and so what they're doing is they're actually training them to grow more of these certain food items and then they can get, they're really, these bacon bugs are really high in protein. And so they're improving the health of the kids who are eating them. And so that's one thing, is just getting really creative with how um, you implement conservation practices. And then for the pet trade, um, there's actually something that we're working on in the lab right now. But um, ring-tailed lemurs are being taken from the wild at alarming rates. Um, and it's actually thought to be causing population crashes um, because every hotel wants to have a lemur because tourists are more likely to stay at hotels with lemurs that are really cute and cuddly that you can play with. Um, the problem being that people don't really know how to take care of those animals. And so they're feeding them rice and just whatever table scraps they have. And so the animals don't last very long. And so they're constantly going back into the forest to get new pets to bring back in. And so this is just driving these, these um, local extinctions of these animals. And so one project that we're actually working on in the lab is a molecular forensics project that uses methods from um, the ivory trade. And so there are these, these methods have been developed using elephant ivory and actually using genetic information that they're able to get from the elephant ivory where they can um, basically map trade networks using DNA. And they're figuring out where the ivory is coming from. So where is it being sourced from? Where is it ending up? And so we're trying to do that same thing with ring-tailed lemurs. So we're actually sampling confiscated pets, so animals that have been kept illegally at hotels and in people's homes and things. They're brought to rehab centers. We get DNA from them. And then we've also gotten DNA from as many wild um, populations as we've been able to find. And then I think with enough individuals and with enough geographic sampling, we're hopefully able, going to be able to pinpoint where, in, if, if there is a hot spot for poaching, hopefully we can pinpoint where they're coming from and then try and increase conservation in those areas. So it's something that's, we've only been working on it for about a year, um, but we've got all you know, hands on deck trying to, to get some answers. Anyone else? Yeah, there's lots of efforts to do it. So um, I know Ed at Kianjavatu has done lots of stuff with rocket stoves. So they make these little briquettes that burn much, has much hotter and for much longer. You, I don't know the details of it though. Um, but so they're doing rocket stoves. We actually, well, there's, there's hydroelectricity. Um, Engineers Without Borders is going in and trying to build um, things like this. Also, um, the nice thing is that solar panels are getting a heck of a lot cheaper. The problem being that in rainforests, there's just not enough sun. So, um, so people are definitely working on it. And it's not, I mean, one thing that, the one issue you run into in conservation is there's not a lot of dialogue between conservation organizations. So it's like reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, but hopefully that'll change moving forward. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you very much.